Welcome to the podcast. I'm Angela Bobier, and this is Life in the Talbot Settlement, brought to you by Tircano Heritage Society and Bacchus Page House Museum. In this series, we will do our best to give you a full appreciation of the history of Western Algon County in southwestern Ontario, from First Nations through the original European settlers to the 1950s. I'll cover one topic per episode, with the first eight setting the tone for who we are, where we are, and what we do here at Bacchus Page House Museum. Please follow us on all social media by searching at Bacchus Page House, spelt B-A-C-K-U-S, P-A-G-E-H-O-U-S-E. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. In this episode of the podcast, we'll talk about some of the necessary, basic tools to survive and fulfill your settler duties in the Talbot Settlement. Let's start with the axe potentially the most vital and multi-use tool a settler would need. It had extensive everyday uses, ceremonial purposes, and could be used as a weapon when needed. The axe was used to clear land, dig, fell trees, split wood, and on and on. If it was all you had, it did the work of a saw, adze, plow, and more. Getting crops into the newly cleared fields was vital and timely. In the absence of other equipment, your axe was enough to dig the ground around the remaining tree stumps and plant a corn, wheat, or potato crop. Trade axes were perhaps one of the most important and essential trade items produced. These axes were imported from European countries by the thousands, although many were made on site at trading posts and forts by blacksmiths. Axe heads for these were hand forged, made from a single piece of iron, heated and folded over a mandrel to make an eye or handle and forge welded together, sometimes referred to as a lap weld. Early eyes were round holes, later the eyes became teardropped or oval shaped, and later still rectangular. Handles or helves were made by the natives or white traders. Many axe heads had maker's marks, or commonly referred to as touch marks. Touch marks were usually made with an iron touching the axe head when it was red hot, making the mark. Cast or factory made axe heads with maker's marks are often referred to as guild marks. The most commonly found style of axe heads are known as the French style or Biscay style, since they were manufactured in the Biscay region of France. Axes were a very personal item, and the handles were particularly customizable to fit the individual. Mostly carved out of wood, the curvature of the axe handle could be varied to reflect whether the owner was left or right-handed, as well as reflect their arm length. Next is a drag and harrow. Upgrading from an axe to prepare their fields, farmers used a drag and harrow, as well as hand rakes. Pulled by a single or pair of draft horses or oxen, the drag and harrow provided weed control, seed coverage, broke up soil clumps, and leveled after plowing. Predating the more efficient disc harrow, drag harrows were originally made of large tree limbs with no spikes. Colloquially known as a crude harrow, this model is described as rude to the ground by Thomas McQueen in the book, The Pioneer Farmer and Backwoodsman. Instead of breaking the soil through the efficiency of the tool, it sought the same results with blunt force. When stumps remained in the fields, this process was a challenge as the harrow would become stuck between the stumps. This led to the creation of a triangle-shaped harrow with large four to five pound spikes attached. The triangle frame was intentionally designed to easily overturn dislodging itself from stumps and other obstructions in the fields. This process was no easy feat and would require multiple passes to match the results of more efficient, modern farming equipment. But until the stumps were removed, plows or larger harrows couldn't attempt to navigate the fields. Newly burned stumps opened the door for the introduction of larger, more efficient harrows with increased spikes such as chain harrows. This came with its own challenges when working a freshly burned field 
clods of soot and ash would be stirred into the air, visually impairing the farmers and coating everything in proximity with soot. The time of year brought other plights, most notably high activity among biting insects resulting in irritable oxen and people too. All methods of escape were undergone to evade the ruthless horseflies, blackflies, and mosquitoes. When netting was not efficient or accessible at all, grease could be smeared in a thick layer over one's face and the back of your hands. An account from the pioneer farmer and backwoodsman states that, quote, when smoke screens were set up against these merciless pests, the cattle and even deer from the forest came to obtain a respite, end quote. Next, we'll talk about your musket and your bullet mold. Until the mid-19th century, muskets were the primary gun used. They were necessary for hunting and also used for personal, livestock, and crop protection. This style of gun used musket balls as ammunition, and these could easily be made in the home with bars of lead purchased from general stores or tradesmen. The lead melts at a lower temperature than iron, so when heated in an iron ladle, it could be poured into a spherical mold to set. Packed in the barrel with small squares of linen and some black powder, muskets were fired via the flintlock system. Early rifles used the same method with a few alterations. With a rifled barrel, the rifle had better aim than its predecessor, the musket. It used bullets which had better aerodynamics than musket balls, and there was no fouling of black powder in the barrel or pan of the gun. Hunting was a year-round job, and while the crops were in, settlers made a dual-purpose game of it. To reduce the impact of wild animals eating their crops, boys would split into groups and over three days compete to see who could get the most game. In addition to hunting with a musket, snares and nets were used to catch rabbits, pigeons, and other small game. Speaking of hunting, you would need something to cook this food in. So the cook pot was one of the most important tools that you could have. So we'll move into the women's realm of domesticity. She has some vital basics as well. Until cook stoves were widely available in the 1850s and settlers were established, all hot meals were cooked in a single pot. That is a lot of stew and pot roast. All households had a cast iron pot. Most had legs to stand above the coals and flames of the fire if they weren't hanging over the fire by a pot extender, metal arm, or tripod. The accompanying utensils, primarily spoons and ladles, would have long handles to reduce the heat transfer up to the cook's hands. Even when made of wood, without the thermal conductive properties of metal spoons, long handles were still necessary to keep the cook's hands a safe distance from the heat and flames. Additionally, you should have a sewing kit. Now who hasn't lost a needle? For anyone that has sewn anything, you know how they seemingly vanish. But as a settler, you do not want to lose one of these important little tools. Using the same technique as today, drawn steel needles required greater infrastructure to produce and were manufactured predominantly in Germany, France, and China. In a settler context, with the absence of local industrialization, needles had to be imported, making them harder to acquire. Having a needle, thread, and thimble in one's sewing kit was a staple for the everyday, and not just for mending clothes. Farm life does not come without its accidents and injuries, not then and not now. A needle, when sterilized, doubled as a standard medical tool, stitching sutures to close cuts and lacerations either at home or by the local doctor. Some of our local families, such as the Stories, the Pattersons, the Pierces, and Bacchus families, would have had their looms and spinning wheels with them. Homespun sheep's wool and linen made from flax, both materials produced on the farm, were the primary sources used. However, the home production of woolens and especially homespun linen saw a significant decline in Upper Canada during the mid-19th century. Tracked through the resources, i.e. cotton, wool, linen, silk, etc. Purchases and production of different fabrics were recorded in the census throughout the early 1800s. Textile purchases indicate women's market participation and the shift away from self-sufficiency. Although we've covered some of the basic items needed for success as a settler in the Talbot settlement, resourcefulness is perhaps the most ingrained quality they held. Settlers made do with what they had. In 1819, 
Finley McDermott was ill in harvest time and unable to reap their one and one half acres of wheat, which probably with a few potatoes would be their sole supply for the coming winter. But Grandma McDermott, with a butcher knife, cut the entire crop because she had neither scythe nor sickle with which to do the work. And that's just one of the stories of perseverance that you can find in both Dunwich and Aldeborough. Sources for today's episode come from D. McCullough's Textile Purchases by Ordinary Upper Canadians, Graham Forsdyke's The Art of Needlemaking, Bobby Kalman's The Kitchen, Historic Communities, and Edwin C. Gillette's The Pioneer Farmer and Backwoodsman. Please join us next week to find out how the coming of the railroad in 1872 impacted the Talbot settlement. Please share the podcast with your friends and follow us on all social media platforms at Bacchus Page House. The Bacchus Page House Museum and Turconnell Heritage Society acknowledges the land we are on today as the traditional territory of First Nations people, the Attawandaron and the Iroquois. As settlers at a settler-focused museum, we value both the significant historical and contemporary contributions of all original peoples and ask how we can be supportive in Indigenous cultural renewal. Life in the Talbot Settlement is a production of Turconnell Heritage Society, operators of Bacchus Page House Museum, funded by the Department of Canadian Heritage. Your host has been Angela Bobier. Music provided by Jack Whitmer. Thanks to our producer, Caitlin Reedsma. To make a charitable donation and to contact the Bacchus Page House Museum, visit our website, www.bacchuspagehouse.ca. And thank you for listening.